Hello, True Health Seeker, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. I'm loving the series that we've been doing on gut health and healing the body by healing our gut. If you haven't already listened to uh, the last episode we did, episode 439, as I think it, it plays really well into today's episode with a gastroenterologist who focuses on, instead of using drugs and surgery, focuses on using food to heal the gut. And so I know these two episodes play really well together. And then after this episode, so 441 is going to be an amazing episode about healing the gut as well and tests that we can order to fully understand the foods that we uh, want to eat or avoid to properly feed the microbiome. Why is it that your husband can eat one food, but if you eat that same food, you'd get bloated? Or why is it that uh, some people can eat a certain way and be fine, but other people are not, even though those are both healthy foods? Well, that is going to be uh, uncovered in episode 441. So we're continuing our series on gut healing Something I've found with uh, the podcast, with Learn Trail podcast, is uh, guests tend to book themselves all clumped together, and it ends up being the same, uh, the same subject. So I, I reach out to many different holistic health professionals. I give them a link, and they sign up to become a uh, to get on my schedule, and they choose the date that works best for them. And so many times it turns out that within one week, I'll have several interviews that are all about the same thing, that are all about heart health or all about gut health. And I didn't coordinate it. And they don't know each other and they don't know that they're doing it. But so many times I've sat down and looked at my calendar and realized that I'll have several interviews in the row about the same topic, not covering the, the exact same information, but... Um, but complementing each other. And this is where I really feel that God and divine intervention are taking place on so many levels in our life. And I can see it when uh, when these episodes come together in such a wonderful way. So I believe that the, the, the latest episodes that have been published and are going to be published really complement each other. And I invite you to look at your life and see where wonderful divine intervention is taking place, uh, possibly the information you're hearing today. I've heard from several um, listeners. They'll contact me through email or through Facebook and they'll say, you know, I was just praying or I was just thinking about wanting this information and boom, I turned on your podcast and they were talking about exactly what I wanted to hear. That is so cool. I just love that. I love how uh, what we focus on and what we want to have show up in our life, we can we can create it. Um, neurologically speaking, it's the the reticular ad activating system, which is a part of the brain that will seek out what we choose to focus on. Uh, if you're someone who has anxiety or would love to learn more about how the brain works and how we can optimize our life for success and eliminate procrastination, eliminate anxiety. I invite you to take my course. So I'm a master practitioner and trainer of neurolinguistic programming, and I spent 14 months putting this course together. It is a wonderfully fun course where you learn all these techniques, the behavioral change techniques for um, personal growth and development. Go to learntruehealth.com and in the menu, click on the Free Your Anxiety course and take it. It's, it's phenomenal. I love it. And I do give a money back guarantee if you take it. It's not your cup of tea, although so many listeners have said it's been completely life-changing. So I invite you to check that out. I also invite you to check out the course that I put together with my dear friend Naomi, where we have filmed ourselves cooking in the kitchen, delicious recipes, and we also include information on how to heal the body um, with teas and herbs and different foods, both cooked and raw, and why those fibers or those nutrients in those foods are so healing for the body. So if you love listening to the podcast, you're going to love the Learn Your Health Home Kitchen membership. Check it out. Try it for a month. It's less than $10. 
to just try it for a whole month and get all the delicious recipes out of it. And, and if you continue to enjoy it, continue being a member, you'll be supporting the Learn to Health podcast. This is what I do full time. And so you'd be supporting uh, me to continue putting out these episodes, um, but also helping you and supporting you and your family to learn delicious recipes that are designed to heal the body and, and, and nutrify the body. So you can go to learntohealth.com slash home kitchen for more information about that. And like I said, also check out the free, free Your Anxiety course. It is very powerful. And please come join the Learn Your Health Facebook group. We'd love to see you there. We have a wonderful community of people that are totally into holistic health and healing and uh, love to answer questions and support each other and share insights and share inspiration. Uh, so whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're looking to heal or to optimize, uh, we're a whole community that wants to get behind you and get to behind each other and support each other in our success. Thank you so much for being a listener. Thank you so much for sharing this podcast with those you love. Continue to share the episodes that you know will make a big difference. We're going to turn this ripple into a tidal wave and help as many people as possible to learn true health. Enjoy today's interview. Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 440. I'm so excited for today's guest. We have on the show a doctor that specializes in healing the gut. And isn't that the first place we need to start when it comes to building our health? I'm really excited to have you on the show. Dr. Will Bolshewitz, welcome to the show. Ashley, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's an honor to be here. I'm excited to talk about it. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled that you focus on healing the gut when so many doctors just throw drug after drug after drug at people. Um, I know in my 20s, I was so sick. I had chronic infections and every time I went to the MD, I got another antibiotic and I'm sure that did mm. not help. Uh, years of being on antibiotics did not help my health. And uh, one of the first things I had to do was heal my gut. And what a difference it makes when you um, heal the gut first. So much comes comes into balance. So I'm really excited to hear your story, though. What what happened in your life that made you want to become an MD? Which which normally MDs don't want to go, don't typically go the route of holistic medicine, right? That's not that's, that's not a typical MD move. So what happened in your life that made you want to become an MD? But then what happened that made you want to help help people heal their body and heal their gut with food? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I think that when we have individual experiences similar to what you described in your own life, those things motivate you and drive you to think outside of the box, um, particularly when you have to go outside the box to find your solution to begin with. So for me, you know, how I became a doctor really starts from a really simple thing, which is the desire to do something where I would help people. And so I started down that path. I mean, I basically made the decision when I was in high school, 16 years old, and this is what I want to do with my life. And that was the motivation. I mean, truly, if I, you know, if it was about money, you should go into banking, not medicine. And um, so I started down that path. And I didn't really get there until I was 34 years old. But during that process, I, I it feels like I woke up one day and I was 30. And I felt like I was 60. And I look in the mirror and I weigh 50 pounds more than I did in high school, which is for me a tough pill to swallow because I was a three three sport athlete. So I think of myself as as an athlete. And there I am looking in the mirror and I have this gut and I have high blood pressure, tons of anxiety, low self-esteem and tremendous fatigue to the point that I'm basically caffeinated 24 hours a day, like drinking coffee at nine o'clock at night. And something had to change. And I, I, I trained at these great American institutions. I went to Georgetown for med school. I was the chief medical resident at Northwestern, one of the top internal medicine residencies in the entire country. And I went to the University of North Carolina for my GI training. And within my field in gastroenterology, many people consider UNC to be, if not the best, clearly one of the top two or three. 
And so I trained at these great institutions, but here's this problem that I have. I weigh 50 pounds more than I used to. I, you know, high blood pressure, high anxiety, and I don't know how to fix my own issue. I, you know, at that point in my life, I was incredibly good at dealing with the care of an acutely ill person who is crashing in the hospital. That's what I had been built for. That's what I had spent so much time training on, which is the person who might die unless you do something and then you do that thing and you bring them back. That's what I was good at. But I was not good at conventional uh, healthcare, taking care of the routine person, giving them dietary advice, preventing illness as opposed to waiting for the illness to arrive. I wasn't good at that because the system didn't prepare me for that. And so I needed a solution. I needed a solution in my own life. So being a typical type A, you know, medical doctor type, I decided to try to work my way out of it with exercise. And I started showing up at the gym six days a week, 30 to 45 minutes of heavy weights, and then jump on the treadmill for a five to 10 K during the winter. Or if it was the summertime, go to the community pool and swim a hundred laps. I did that six days a week. I could build strength. I could build muscle. I could build endurance. I couldn't lose the gut. And so when things changed for me was when I met the person who actually is now my wife, because we went on a date and I have to tell you, like at this point in my life, I'm in my early thirties and I'd never been around anyone who was ve vegetarian, let alone vegan. I mean, I honestly didn't even really know what the difference was. And I see this person that I'm on a date with who's eating completely plant-based and she's eating without restriction, cleaning the plate, loving her food, completely satisfied. And meanwhile, I have a post-meal hangover and, you know, I'm struggling just to keep up after because I want to go home and put on some sweatpants. And, and so this relationship opened my eyes and made me think. Maybe it's the diet that I was raised on. Maybe the food that I have consumed since childhood is what is actually affecting my body in a negative way and holding me back. And so I started to make um, changes in my nutrition. It wasn't a radical change. It wasn't you know going all the way to one extreme. It was just making simple substitutions. Like instead of going out for fast food, I'd go home and I'd make a big, like 30 something ounce smoothie. Or instead of drinking a two liter of soda, which I actually did back then, I would drink water. And making those simple substitutions, next thing I know, the fat is just melting off my body. The blood pressure issue goes away. The anxiety lifts my self-esteem surges, and I start feeling young and vibrant and alive again. And it was so powerful that I, I said, why have I not heard anything about this? I trained at these great places. How come, how come I was never taught anything about this? And I turned to the medical literature thinking there must not be anything out there that, you know, this must be a space where we just don't have the studies yet. And I was really shocked when I found that there were like literally thousands of high quality studies that already were already in existence and I just hadn't been taught about them. And, and so this motivated me to start devouring uh, nutritional information and I was studying in my free time. I was doing it at night. I was staying up to do it. And then I was bringing what I found into my medical practice using it to take care of my patients with digestive issues and seeing radical transformations in their life on par with the way that it changed in mine. And that was so provocative that, I mean, I, I, like, I have to tell you, I never in a million years thought that I would be on this podcast with you or talking about my New York Times bestselling book or having an Instagram account with 150,000 followers. I never thought any of those things because it wasn't the plan. I'm a guy who creates plans. I think they're going to happen. 
And all of a sudden, here I am, and this was like 2016, and I just felt like I had to share this story of what was happening in my clinic. And I didn't really like social media at all. I still don't. But I felt compelled to share, and so I started posting stuff and not really thinking anyone would be interested. And, you know, one thing led to another. And in 2018, I did a podcast interview that went viral. 300,000 people have listened to this podcast now. And when that happened, the energy was so profound surrounding these ideas that I was putting out there. There was so much energy that I was like, I have to compile this into something so that people can get the whole story in a structured, organized fashion. And there's really no better way to do that than to write a book. And so that's when I decided in August of 2018 that that's what I wanted to do. And I spent basically the next year and a half doing it, um, you know, investing everything that I had, all my effort, waking up early, five in the morning, writing like I was at Starbucks here in Charleston, South Carolina, from 5 a.m. until 7.30. They know me really well at the Starbucks. I know the deals. Like I know that you can get like a free refill if you want it. And um, basically wrote this book and then it came out in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I just had to adapt to that. And But the bottom line is that here it is. It's arrived. And two months after release, 35,000 people have bought a copy of this book. Nice. And I'm getting, yeah, and I'm getting messages like, and if you just go back to that 16 year old kid who sat there and said, I want to help people. And that has been what's motivated and driven me this whole time. And, um, like people may, they may or may not know this. A book itself does not pay the bills. And I pay the bills with my medical practice. I, I, a practice, I'm a full-time gastroenterologist. Um, but uh, to get messages from people from around the world who have read the book and are healing their digestive issues, healing their autoimmune or their hormonal or their metabolic or their mood issues, um, restoring function to their body, to get those messages on a daily basis is incredible. It's a dream come true for a doctor. So you, you have a clinic as a gastroenterologist. Uh, what does that look like? Are you doing um, colonoscopies? What does it look like to go to you um, if someone has gut issues? Yeah, yeah, so I spend about half my time doing procedures. So during that time that I'm doing procedures, I do colonoscopies and upper endoscopies. Where, like for example, an upper endoscopy it is typically a five to 10 minute procedure and it allows me to look in the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, allows me to, uh, for example, take biopsies for celiac disease, which these days, unfortunately, are blood tests for celiac disease. I don't know how much people realize this, but the blood tests are completely inaccurate or completely, in, completely inadequate mm -hmm. in terms of testing for celiac disease. And so the endoscopy is the gold standard that allows me to firmly know whether or not um, a per person has that. And, and I also spend my time doing colonoscopies. Um, a big portion of that is colon cancer screening. But then the other half of my time, this is part of what I love about my field. One of the things that I love is that I, I get to use my mind and to be very personal with my patients and have relationships, but I also get to use my hands and that's kind of fun. Um, so half of my time is spent in the clinic, you know, talking to people, hearing their health history, breaking down what the problems are, creating complex plans of how to attack them, and um, finding solutions. Uh, I have an interesting guest. Have you heard of Chef AJ? I love Chef AJ. She's a dear friend. Okay, great. So she tells her story in, in um, one of our, our past interviews. She's been on the show twice. I think it was the first interview I had her on. And she shares that she, um, although was was vegan for ethical reasons, was a junketarian, ate lots of junk food, and she went for a um, colonoscopy cancer screening, and her doctor found precancerous polyps, bloody polyps through her whole colon, and her colon looked just totally destroyed. And then um, she's so afraid of of surgery that she um, 
she decided not to get surgery to have them removed, but she ended up going to a, a center and doing a, a, a deep, like a cleanse, doing a raw food, vegan, uh, whole, whole food, but a, the foods were alive. And uh, she did that. And then she came back six months later and had uh, her colonoscopy and her, her doctor got very angry at her. Have you heard her story when she tells it? I don't think I've heard this okay, part. Okay, so her doctor gets really angry at her. So I imagine it's the doctor was the sa same same kind of profession as as you are in terms of you know. So he's sitting there and he's doing the the colonoscopy and he just starts getting angry and he goes, "Who did your surgery?" And she said, "What What are you talking about? You're my doctor. You know, I I I have insurance with you. I would I wouldn't go to a different doctor if I if I'm, I'm terrified of surgery. If I were to get a surgery, I would be with you." And he's sitting there, camera, you know, staring at her colon, going. You, someone did a surgery on you. I knew where every single polyp was and all the precancerous polyps and none of them are here. They're all gone. And your, your, your intestine, your, your colon looks like vascular and healthy, like a newborn baby. And it used to look just like disgusting and purple and, you know, whatever colors that just that it looked like before. And, um, and he was visibly upset at her because he did not believe mm -hmm. that she healed her body with food. But there was another doctor who was maybe like a resident or something from India. And she whispered to Chef A, she, go, she goes, I believe you. Because this doctor had seen, you know, coming from India where it's more um, acceptable to heal the body with food. Uh -huh. So it was interesting. I've heard many stories of, and I've had my own personal experiences where MDs just do not believe you can heal the body with food. That it's right. part of the training. So what happened in medical school? Did were, did you have teachers say to you like, no, what, you can't heal the body with food? Do they actually like try to tell you guys that? Or why is it that most MDs don't believe you can heal the body with food? And I love that you have broken away that it's kind of like you came out of the matrix and you're able to think for yourself and go, no, we can heal the body with food. We, you know, like drugs are a tool, but they're not the only solution. And, and it's, and since we're putting something in our mouth that our body's using to build healthy cells, Shouldn't we look first to food? Like what happened that had that did, did anything, any part of your education try to tell you that we can't heal with food? You know, I, I think that there's a, a pervasive culture of allopathic Western medicine that stands in the way of accepting these types of ideas. And that's unfortunate. And I think, um, it's something that is hindering the quality of care and also the quality of the relationship with the individual patient. Because at the end of the day, if you try to tell a, a, a reasonable, rational person that the food that you eat makes no difference, any reasonable or rational person would say, that's BS. That's BS. How can you possibly say that the food that you eat makes no difference? It's very obvious that the food that you eat does make a difference. So if it does make a difference, how much of a difference does it make? And the, you know, modern uh, science shows us that if you look across all of humanity on our planet and you were to quantify health and disease, you would discover that just 20% of actual disease is driven by genetics. Now, I mean, look, there's individual diseases. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, Down syndrome. Okay. If you have the gene, you have the, you have the disease. But if you look across all humanity, just 20% of disease is driven by genetics, which means that 80% is driven by our environment, driven by diet and lifestyle. And that you know, the 80,000 pounds of food that we are going to eat during our lifetime, that will always be far more powerful than a couple of milligrams of medication. And you can't prevent disease effectively with medication. I mean, there's very little evidence to support that that works. You can't overcome a bad diet with medication. You can't make someone back to net neutral. The best that you can do is cover it up. That's the best you can do is just cover up the problem with a medication. And that's not really addressing the root of the issue. If our problem 
exists because of our diet and lifestyle, then to ignore our diet and lifestyle in the treatment plan is to never actually address the root of the issue. So from my perspective, we need to go there. We have to go there. Now, I can't say that there was ever any sort of um, conversation where people said like that there was formal teaching that no diet is worthless or diet is not important. There was, it was, that was never said. It's more so that if you withhold the education on diet mm-hmm. and nutrition, if you never actually provide that information to people and all you do is ask them to study and learn, you know, the side effects of all these bazillion drugs and the indications and, you know, how to do this surgery. If that's all that you teach them, then it's, it's unrealistic to expect them to just automatically transition as, as intelligent as medical doctors are. They're not trained and taught how to have a conversation about conventional nutrition. That's the problem. Yeah, absolutely. In college, um, when I took anatomy, my teacher was actually a, a retired neurosurgeon. And when it came to studying the joints, he said, once someone has, because we also studied pathology with him, when, when someone has arthritis, when, you're, when your client has arthritis, they cannot regrow it. Once, once you have damaged your cartilage, you cannot regrow cartilage, no supplements work. And he got kind of angry, like, like supplements don't work and diet doesn't work. Nothing works. Once someone has arthritis, that's it. They're done. You can't regrow cartilage. And so I, 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 I had, obviously he's, he must be smarter than me. He was a neurosurgeon. He knows what he's talking about. And I just thought it was really interesting. Years later, I met a naturopathic physician who regularly helps his, his patients and clients reverse arthritis regularly. I know um, a friend of mine, her mom, in, in six weeks on a whole food plant-based diet, all of her arthritis symptom, symptoms went away. So it's amazing what the body can heal. And it's also amazing that we're taught by people we put on a pedestal, people that we put in, in authority, we're told that we can't heal. Now, it, as a client, as a patient is on a t- your table and you're doing a colonoscopy and you see they have polyps, so let's use the Chef AJ's example. Let's see their colon is is, is bleeding a little bit. That uh, definitely does not look vascular and healthy. Uh, maybe it looks just like discolored and they've got some polyps that you identify as possible precancerous polyps. What's what's your next step with them versus a t- other doctors? What do you what do you do with them to help them to heal their body? Well, I think that from from my perspective, the um, the solution is in having a conversation about diet and nutrition. That, that's where the opportunity lies, and a big part of the issue, from my perspective is the absence of fiber in the American diet. Mm. So, yeah, um, if, you, if you look at the consumption of fiber in the United States, we may be the culture with the least consumption of fiber in human history. I mean, we certainly are probably about as close as we could get to the worst. Um, the average American is consuming 15 grams of fiber per day. Now, to put that into perspective, 15 grams, the minimum recommendation on a daily basis for women is 25, for men is 38. And when we do these, it's really, actually, it's really embarrassing when we do these fiber studies, because the way that we'll set them up is we'll say, let's compare high fiber consumers to low fiber consumers. And what you'll see when the study is done in the United States is you'll see, oh, the high fiber consumers are getting 22 or 23 grams of fiber per day. And most people don't know enough about fiber, including the doctors, to register the point that even the high fiber consumers in these studies are not even getting the minimum recommended amount on a daily basis. It's embarrassing. And so 97% of Americans are not getting enough. When I say fiber, by the way, I'm talking about fiber from real food. Fiber comes from plants. Plants have a monopoly on fiber. And the way that you should get your fiber is by eating fruits, vegetables, whole grains, seeds, nuts, and legumes. So the reason that I want to motivate fiber consumption is that I know that the vast majority of Americans are wildly devoid of fiber in their diet. 
And also because I know that there is a direct connection between fiber and the prevention of colon cancer. So let's unpack that a little bit. When we eat fiber, it's not just, I mean, we've kind of been taught that fiber goes in the mouth and just kind of goes through, sweeps through the colon. Some people describe it that way. It sweeps through and it just comes out the other end as a, as a torpedo. <laughs> All right. You know, that's like sort of the traditional, you know, teaching on fiber. And, you know, we, we always think of grandma stirring the orange drink so that she could have herself a bowel movement. We need to update our definition. We need to understand the actual way that fiber works in the body, which is that there's many different types of fiber. They're not all the same. We have oversimplified fiber by just counting grams or just calling it soluble or insoluble fiber. And the reason why we've simplified it so much is because fiber is incredibly biochemically complex. So if you were to look at fiber molecules, like I was a chemistry major in college, I look at them just like, what the heck is that? And so because of that complexity, we just, we try to keep it as simple as we can. And we look at it as soluble and insoluble fiber. Well, insoluble fiber kind of does what we traditionally think of fiber. It just kind of goes in the, in the mouth and it comes out the other end. But soluble fiber is a totally different story. Soluble fiber passes through the small intestine untouched and it arrives into the colon and when it gets there, your gut microbes, which reside predominantly in your colon, they get into an absolute feeding frenzy. They go crazy because fiber is their preferred food. You're feeding your gut. And when you feed them, they consume it. These microbes become stronger. They become uh, energized. And because of that, they are more capable of upholding your human physiology. These microbes are so central to the way that our body works. We need them in tip-top shape to help us out if we want to be healthy. And, and so when we feed them fiber, that's what we get. We get healthy microbes that are strong and energized and ready to help us. And they help us immediately on the spot because what they do is they take that soluble fiber, they consume it, and then they transform it into short chain fatty acids, short chain fatty acids like butyrate, acetate, and propionate. These short chain fatty acids, we can unpack them. We can talk more about them throughout the entire show. I am obsessed with them. They're an entire chapter in my book. I honestly think this is the biggest secret in all of nutrition that no one is talking about. And we should all be talking about, we get distracted by all these other red herrings. We should be talking about why we need more short chain fatty acids in our life. And when we talk about colon cancer itself, in the study of colon cancer, we discover that short chain fatty acids have been shown to directly impair the development of colon cancer. And so it creates this mechanistic pathway, which is that fiber comes into the colon, connects with the gut microbes. When you put these two ingredients together, prebiotic fiber and these probiotic microbes, you combine them and they basically will create for you these postbiotic short chain fatty acids that will directly impair the development of colon cancer. It's no surprise that colon cancer is the number two cause of cancer death in America because we're completely fiber devoid. If you compare African Americans to native Africans, Native Africans consume a very high fiber, low fat diet. African Americans typically, traditionally consume a very high fat, low fiber diet. And if, I mean, before I even tell you the number to frame this, if you said there was two times the risk of developing colon cancer in the cancer world, that would be a lot. If you said three times, you go, whoa, that's crazy. If you said five, you go, this is completely bonkers. All right, the number is 65. African Americans have 65 times the colon cancer that Native Africans have. It's absurd. It's that's ridiculous. And it's because we're not taking care of our diet, we're not taking care of our microbiome, and we're not feeding our microbiome what it needs to give us these 
these protective molecules, these short chain fatty acids. And when you zoom out and you apply this mechanism, it's more than just this connection from an epidemiology perspective between African Americans and Native Americans uh, and Native Africans. You can find studies from around the world, different cultures, mm -hmm. showing us that high fiber consumers, when I say high fiber, I mean actually high fiber, meaning like definitely more than 38 grams of fiber per day. High fiber consumers have virtually no colon cancer. And there was a major, major, major review done that came out in January of 2019 by Andrew Reynolds. And I wrote about this in my book where it was basically a mega meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is where they compile studies. We have a hierarchy of evidence. And the hierarchy of evidence says that the highest quality evidence comes from a meta-analysis where you compile studies to answer questions. And in this mega meta-analysis where he did multiple meta-analyses, Andrew Reynolds and his science team found numerous benefits to fiber for longevity, for heart disease, and for cancer. In particular, no surprise, colon cancer. That is something to wrap our brains around, isn't it? I, I, I'm fascinated by the microbiome. It's about six pounds of bacteria that live in our gut that help us to, to it actually makes nutrients for us. It helps us digest our food and make nutrients for us. And we live in such a sterile world where, you know, especially now everyone's using hand sanitizers and we're constantly thinking about how, how to sterilize our, our food and food is just dead. The, you know, the average, average household is eating packaged food and the food is just dead. It's void of life. It's, it's void of healthy bacteria. And, and so you're, you're saying we need to adapt a diet that works with our microbiome to get the nutrients the body needs. And that, that's great. The fiber just, it just doesn't go in one end and out the other. It's doing so much more for us. I, I loved learning that fiber helps bind to the toxins that the liver has excreted through the gallbladder um, and, hel and helps to remove the estrogen that the body is getting rid of. It helps the, to remove all of the, the, the chemicals and the pesticides and everything that the, the liver is trying to excrete. Um, and it also binds to like the, the, the cholesterol in the, in the, the, the gall, the, the, the gallbladder. So it's, it's, it's that, that, you know, that gall, the bile juice, uh, it's, it's binding to all of that and bringing it out and that people who are constipated or eat low fiber, the, the colon can reabsorb it. And, and we see that in, um, studies where people do fasting and uh, we, um, I had a guy on the show where he did different things with fasting and they took blood and they found that that um, the body would reabsorb certain pesticides because they were testing for, for chemicals and pesticides. But with fiber, when there was something to bind to it, it, the body wouldn't reabsorb it. So it becomes very exciting. Now, are you saying everyone should go and start drinking Metamucil? <laughs> is does is any any fiber good or are, are certain fibers better than others like um uh, I've, I've heard that there's a, a kind of fiber from potatoes for example or there's um non-resistant starch you know there's all these different kinds of of fibers um which one should we eat I have so much I want to say I'm so excited <laughs> to talk about all this <laughs> you you have the floor <laughs> I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd. And I just, I love everything that you just said. And, and I want to, I want to get into it more. So, um, all right. So to answer your question, uh, and try to not get distracted by so many tangents that I would love to talk about, let's talk about fiber and optimizing fiber. Okay. And it starts with exploring the relationship between fiber and these microbes, which is an incredibly important relationship for the health of our gut microbiome. This is fiber is their preferred food. But let's talk a little bit about what that means. Your gut, let's, let's define the gut a little bit first. Your gut is made up of 39 trillion microbes. That's a ridiculous number. How can we put that into a number that makes sense? Okay, try this. 
we live in uh, the Milky Way. That's our solar system. Take our, our solar system with every single star that exists in the sky. Every single one. And you, you have a hundred solar systems worth of stars living inside of you right now that are microbes. Mostly bacteria, but they also include yeast, archaea, sometimes parasites, and I'm not counting viruses in this number 39 trillion, but there's viruses too. They all live there in harmony and balance. This is an ecosystem. Your gut microbiome, this, this community of microorganisms that, by the way, are as alive as you and I are, they are. There's an ecosystem in the same way that the Great Barrier Reef and the Amazon rainforest are also ecosystems. And if you are a biologist, there is a simple rule that applies to every single ecosystem and is a measure of the health within that ecosystem, which is biodiversity. When you have a more biodiverse Amazon rainforest, a more biodiverse uh, Great Barrier Reef, mm -hmm. you have an ecosystem that is resilient. It is strong. It is prepared for any challenge or perturbation that you throw at it. You know, let's go to the Amazon for a moment. I don't like snakes. They terrify me. I used to have nightmares when I was a kid, like snakes being in my bed. Uh, I don't love mosquitoes. They annoy me. All right. So I don't like these creatures, but here's the issue. If you remove all snakes and all mosquitoes from the Amazon rainforest, you're going to create a biological hole that the other animals are not designed to fill. And there will be a ripple effect that will have negative consequences on the health of the entire Amazon rainforest because of that. So biodiversity is key. We need all of these players. We need as much diversity as possible. And that applies to our microbiome too. We need diversity of species, as many different species as possible. So how do we get there? Okay, well, let's, let's understand how they live because they're alive, which means they need food. They got to eat. And their preferred food is fiber, but not just generically fiber. There are at least millions, maybe even billions of types of different fibers that exist in nature. Every single plant has its own unique types of fiber. And these microbes, they're just like us. They're picky eaters. All right. Now, Chef AJ is vegan. I'm vegan too. But we don't eat the same food. She's got her preferences and I have mine. Guess what? These microbes are just like that. They have their preferences. They don't all eat the same. They don't just generically eat fiber. And so when you eat a particular food, let's use the black bean for an example. You consume black beans, you send these black beans down to your microbiome, and there are specific populations of bacteria that are going to thrive because you just fed them. They will grow. They will be more um, strongly represented within your microbiome, and they will reward you with whatever it is that they do best which may include the production of short-chain fatty acids. They will go to work helping you. But the, the opposite of that is also true. If you say, I am going bean-free, no more black beans. Okay, well, this population of microbes that is waiting to be fed black beans, they're not being fed. And just like us, when you don't feed them, they starve. They grow weaker. And at some point, they grow weak to the point that they're incapable of holding up and doing the job that your body needs them to do. And potentially, it can get to the point where they go extinct. And just like the loss of mosquitoes and snakes within the ecosystem, when you have bacteria within the ecosystem that are not able to do their job, you create a loss of balance where that ecosystem, that gut, is not able to keep up with the rigors of supporting human health anymore. And that's what dysbiosis is. Dysbiosis is a damaged gut that's out of balance. Some people call this leaky gut, and we're basically talking about the same thing. So we want to maintain that biodiversity. And the way that we do that is by recognizing each unique 
species of bacteria has its own way of eating and they like fiber, but not all fiber is the same. Every single plant has its own unique types of fiber. So when we eat as many different varieties of plants as possible, we are delivering as many different types of fiber as possible to our microbiome and therefore supporting the dietary preferences of the broadest diversity of microbes possible. And this is actually like, so this is, this is a core, this is a core idea in my book. This is my central philosophy for human health and diet. And this is the most important thing that I'm going to say in the entire episode. Okay. Not that I want people to turn off after I've said this, I got more to say, but if there's only one thing that you take away from our episode today, let it be this. And this is more than just Dr. B's idea. This is actually scientifically validated. In the largest study to date to make a connection between diet and lifestyle and the health of our microbiome, which is called the American Gut Project. In the American Gut Project, they found that there was a clear-cut number one predictor of a healthy gut, the most powerful driver of gut health was the diversity of plants within your diet. So it's a change of philosophy where this is not about grams of fiber. And this is certainly not about consuming monofibers like, you know, Metamucil. This is about getting as many different types of fiber into your diet as possible so that you can support the biodiversity of your microbiome. And as a result, just like the Amazon rainforest, just like the Great Barrier Reef, you create a lush, biodiverse, stable, strong microbiome that is prepared to uphold the pillars of human health, which are digestion of your food, which basically is access to nutrients. Like what's more important than that? And these microbes beyond that are also connected to our immune system, our hormonal balance, our metabolism, and even our mood and the way that our brain functions. Human health starts in the gut. And the most important part of human health isn't even human. It's these microbes. <laughs> and we need to feed them. We need to feed them. And we're just not feeding them in the United States. We're starving them. And, that's, and then we're surprised when we have epidemic autoimmune disease. Mm, that that came out of nowhere. I mean, when when you and I were kids, autoimmune disease was not uh, as pervasive as it is today. It's definitely on the rise. Would you would you agree with that? Would you say that that the illnesses that we're seeing now are not this not in no way the same numbers as when even when you were in medical school? that we're seeing an increase in these illnesses. I mean, the, the question is, is it that they're getting better at screening, which of course, of course, cause we, you know, technology advances, right? Um, however, there wasn't, there wasn't this much autoimmune issues 20, 30 years ago, was there? You know, to answer the, I mean, yes, there definitely was not. And we can, people can um, argue the statistics in whatever direction. And if they have an agenda, they'll, they'll figure out their way to argue the statistics to feed their agenda. But if you take a step back and you just look objectively, think about something like ulcerative colitis, all right, which presents with profound, profuse diarrhea that's bloody. And it occurs around the clock. You know, you wake up in the middle of the night because you got to go number two. All right. So that to me is not something that you would miss for years on end. That's not detection bias. It either exists or it doesn't exist. And in Brazil, as they, it's quite fascinating to like kind of do a um, epidemiology case study looking at third world countries as they modernize into first world countries. Brazil westernized, really ramping up from the late 80s through the 90s and into the 2000s. They really started to ramp up and westernize. And during that period of time, they saw an 11 to 15% increase in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease on literally a yearly basis. Think about that oh growth. My gosh. That's absurd. And these doctors that were down there 
they had never seen this before. You know, we were very used to treating this in the United States because our epidemic was already fully here. But down there, they had never been seeing this. And so they had to start basically flying up to the United States and attending our meetings and hearing how we treat these patients because they had no experience. Because the diet changed so quickly because the the country became more Americanized and their diet changed to more of an American diet. They changed to a more of an American diet. I mean, you're going to see this. This is starting to unfold in China, too. Mm-hmm. Um, not that we have reliable statistics coming out of China, but, you know, this is they're <laughs> they're all, they're starting to westernize and follow the same patterns. But, you know, and actually, I, I know you would agree with me that it's more than just diet. Yeah. Diet. Diet is the number one driver. OK, um, you know, let's let's take a step back and think of our life in the context of how radically things have changed in a hundred years. Think about your relative, whoever that might be, your great grandparent or your grandparent, whoever that may be a hundred years ago. And, you know, for them, they, there was no processed food. They knew the farmer more than likely. Everything was locally sourced and in season. There was very little use of the of pesticides. At least the modern pesticides had not been invented yet. The animal products that they consumed, if they did consume it, you know, most of them did. At least those animal products were not hyped up or pumped up with antibiotics and hormones. Um, Lifestyle-wise, think of the percentage of people who walked to school back then compared to the percentage that walked to school today. Radically different. Mm-hmm. Think about how they entertained themselves. We we do Twitter at 1030 at night and, and expose ourselves to the blue lights, which, by the way, disrupt our circadian rhythm and suppress our melatonin so that even if we do sleep, we're not getting good sleep. We are watching television. We're sitting on couches. We're sitting in offices and working on computers all day. That's not the way that they lived back then. You know, they were very active. Um, they didn't have access to vehicles for transportation as, as readily as we do these days, you know? So here we are, and there's just been this radical lifestyle and diet transformation that has occurred in the last 100 years where now the average American, their diet is 60% processed foods that didn't exist a hundred years ago. And 30% of the American diet is animal products that are hyped up on hormones and antibiotics and literally just 10 percent of the american diet is fruits vegetables whole grain seeds and nuts and the sad perhaps the saddest part of it all is that when i say 10 percent, actually most of that is french fries so we have made huge huge changes in a very short period of time it's putting an evolutionary strain on these microbes and none of the changes that we've made have have been advantageous to our microbiome. All of them have inflicted harm. And now here we are. Mm. About 15 years ago, I read a really funny book. So if anyone's looking for just to like sip, kick back with a funny but true story, uh, Sex Lives of Cannibals. Have you ever read that book? No, but it's, I love the title. Yeah, the, oh, the, well, the title, I bought it because of the title. I was like, what is this? But it's a true story. So a man um, travels with his wife. Uh, I think it was actually his fiance at the time. And um, and they go to the South Pacific. There's, you know, island chains in the South Pacific, like Venuyatu and Christmas Island. He talks about how hot it is, obviously, down there. Um, I think she works for Red Cross or something. And he's a journalist. And so he thought, this will be fun. I'll bring my typewriter or whatever. Um, or... I don't know if he brought a laptop because the, 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 it was spotty whether they would ever have access to electricity. And they get down there and the first island they, they land on after, um, I think they came from New Zealand. They, they land in a bigger island and it is definitely Americanized. He was, couldn't believe how many fast food joints from America he saw because he thought he was, 
you know, he'd be exposed to a different culture. And yet it just felt like he was in Hawaii, you know, with all the American food. And he also noticed the, the people kind of looked like they were from Hawaii or looked like they're from the United States. And then they ended up going on a smaller island where there was uh, all the native, all the people who lived there ate the way they've eaten for hundreds of years. And uh, they all uh, gardened and fished and lived off the land and they were all very healthy and they didn't have any access to McDonald's. Um, and he just noticed the two and he thought, you know, he just noticed that was interesting and, and, and he didn't go deep into it, but that planted that idea in my mind of, I wonder what it looks like, you know, and we'll be able to see the statistics when we take like, for example, we could probably, this probably been long enough since he wrote that. He pro I think he wrote it 20 years ago. I bet we could go and collect the information of, cause it, they're all Polynesians, right? They're all, uh, genetically similar, but we could go look at this one island that's 50 miles away from this island and see, okay, well, this island, these island people have been eating for the last 20 years um, McDonald's and more of an American. They, ha they have constant access to electricity so they can watch TV. So they're, you know, they, 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 they have more of a influence to eat uh, the, um, uh, the, the way we're eating in the standard American diet. Um, and they have more access to oil and more access to meat and, um, you know, the, the potato chips and whatever. And then we go 50 miles away and these these people are still eating, and they're not vegan by any means, but they're still eating um, coconuts and fish and, you know, whatever vegetables they can grow. And they don't, they don't have, they have very little imported. And we look at their, um, how they've been doing the last 20 years. I thought that, I think that would be really interesting. Just from the microbiome standpoint, the people who stuck to their the diet that they've their ancestors have been eating, a whole food diet versus a diet that's been disrupted, the microbiome has been disrupted by lowering fiber and and consuming oil which also affects the microbiome and and then eating food that's that's dead, that's microwave, that doesn't have any bacteria. Um, and seeing how, because they've disrupted their microbiome, how, how has their health as a, as a people um, changed? Uh, I think that would be a really interesting study. And I'm sure, I'm sure people are doing it, like you said, uh, looking at those from Africa versus um, those who, who born and raised in America, but have um, their ancestors are from Africa and seeing the differences. And I've heard of people from Japan. Japan used to have an incredibly low rate of heart disease, and now they don't. And it's right. and, and and Okinawa used to be a blue zone, and now it's exactly. now it's right. not. The people right. have changed their diet enough that it's no longer people are no longer living into their hundreds on a regular basis and super healthy. So we, I guess, I want to. Um, I would like to address the urgency that we need to turn this ship around, like. Yeah. On a personal level, Okinawa in one generation is no longer a healthy population. Like we need to, we can't wait any longer. Like things are going downhill. We need to uh, uh, take individual responsibility and turn this around right now. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. So let me talk a little bit about what you just laid out with the South Pacific, which by the way, I love that idea and I find it to be fascinating. I think the South Pacific is very interesting too, by the way. But there's actually a guy, his name is Justin Sonnenberg, who's a microbiome researcher, world class, mm. one of the leading microbiome researchers, wrote a great book, by the way, it's called The Good Gut. And he endorsed my book, Fiber Fueled. He was fully in support of everything that I wrote in my book. And Sonnenberg has done these studies on a population of people called the Hudza. Mm -hmm. And they live in Tanzania, in Africa. And they are tribal and they are um, pre-agrarian, meaning that they are hunters and gatherers. And so he has basically taken a look at their life, the way they eat, and then he also has done microbiome analyses on them. And what's fascinating is, so first of all, let's talk about their diet. Again, they don't have crops. There's no, there's no farm. And they're not part of organized society. They're not going into the supermarket. They don't have dollars and cents. Um, so they're 
you know, as described, um, foraging for their food and then to a degree hunting. And they're not vegan. They're, um, they're eating a omnivore diet. But if you look at what they eat, they eat more than 100 grams of fiber per day. More than 100 grams of fiber per day. And if you look at the diversity, so as I said before, diversity of plants feeds a diverse gut microbiome. If you look at the diversity in their diet, they eat 600 varieties of plants on a yearly basis. A lot of it is seasonal. So like berries come in the season, they start eating berries again. Mm -hmm. And then something else comes in the season, they eat that. 100 grams of fiber per day, 600 varieties of plants. Ashley, let me ask you a question in all seriousness. Give me just ballpark, rough estimate off the top of your head. How many different plants do you think you eat on a yearly basis? Oh, jeez. I mean, I just went grocery shopping at Costco this morning. We have a great Costco with organic broccoli, cauliflower, corn, spinach, mixed greens. So there's maybe like th three different kinds of greens in there. And we eat potatoes, brown rice. Oh, cauliflower, I say cauliflower, uh, Brussels sprouts. I think I just rotate like about 20 different vegetables. So okay. pro I probably eat 20, 20, 20 different vegetables a year, maybe, maybe 30, but on a regular basis, probably 20. Okay. And, and does that, does the number 30 include uh, whole grains, seeds, nuts, legumes, fruit? I would say vegetables, like probably 30 vegetables, different kinds of vegetables a year. And then maybe yep. like I, I get a variety of potato, I like pota different potatoes and yams and sweet potatoes and different squash and gourd, you know, those gourds. Okay. Maybe 50, maybe so 50 or 60 50? different. Yeah. I mean, I really do try to get a variety, but maybe, maybe 50 yeah. or between 50 and 60. If you include fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, legumes, and beans. Yep. Um, okay. And I, I don't have an exact number. I don't, I don't track I'm gonna, my, I'm going to do, I'm going to write it down. I'm going to start thinking about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and we can, and we can, uh, talk a little more about what number people should have in mind on a weekly basis. Um, uh, but, but just to, um, uh, uh, continue the conversation with regard to the Hudza, you know, I mean, I, if I had to estimate for myself, I would probably guess I'm 60 or 70. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for most Americans are certainly less than 50. And the Hudza are over here having 600 <laughs> on a yearly basis, 600 different plants. And then, so that would lead us to believe if my theory from prior conversation is correct, they should have a more diverse microbiome. And guess what? They do. It's radically more diverse. In fact, they have 30% more diversity than the average Brit. And they have 40% more diversity than the average American. We are born with a 40% deficit in terms of biodiversity, the measure of a healthy microbiome. We are born with 40% less biodiversity than you find in this population of native tribal people. That shows you how much things have changed on a radical basis. And um, there's actually uh, a doctor who's associated with the American Gut Project who has created this, I mean, I, it's kind of interesting to think about, but it's also terrifying. He's created a doomsday microbe bank. So basically what he's done is he said, I'm worried that, that we're killing too many species too fast. I'm worried that we're eroding our microbiome so fast that we're just going to be disease stricken. Mm -hmm. And so what he's done is he started to go around these, I mean, the sad thing is these Hudza, the tribe is falling apart mm. because basically the, uh, just like in Okinawa, the younger generation doesn't want to carry on the tradition. They want a cell phone. They want a job. They want money. They want to watch television. And so, I mean, they're not living in, uh, you know, uh, some place where they don't even know that real society exists. They know it's out there. They, you know, they're choosing to continue what they have. And so, the, so the tribe is eroding. And so the concern that they have is that we may lose these microbes forever. So they've created this doomsday microbe bank where 
one day if we need to open up the bank and multiply these microbes and bring them back, we have the ability to do that if we need to. So going back to the urgency of this, there's a few things I want to talk about with regard to this. Um, and part of it is individual health, okay? Which is that if you wake up one day and you have Crohn's disease, you can't just walk that back. You have it. And I, I personally believe, and I take care of these people for a living, there's no such thing as cure. Once you have Crohn's disease, there's remission. That's the best that you can do. And you may be able to put yourself into a deep remission and keep yourself there, effectively having the appearance of a cure. But there is no cure. You're always vulnerable to the recurrence of Crohn's disease. So and you don't want to wake up one day and have this. And so even in health, it becomes imperative that we nurture the health of our microbiome. The second thing, Sonnenberg, who is the doctor from Stanford who is studying the Hudza, He's done some other studies that I, I think are super fascinating. Um, if you think about the transfer of microbes from mother to child, that's where we get started in life. Um, if we pass through the birth canal instead of cesarean section, the birth canal is our first exposure to the outside world and it's designed to basically inoculate us with these microbes. And so there's an inheritance that uh, occurs as a result of mom passing down microbes to child. And there's a question, could we alter the inheritance of microbes in a way that's detrimental to future generations? We all care about our kids. Many of us care more about our kids than we do about ourselves. And so Sonnenberg, you can't recreate this study in humans because a generation of humans takes 25 years. But you can do this study in mice very quickly using human microbes, the same microbes that we have. So Sonnenberg did mouse studies looking at generational differences in the microbiota and the biodiversity. Again, biodiversity is key to the health of the ecosystem. And what he found is that if you withdraw fiber from these mice, there is a generational loss of species that compounds. So for example, if grandma has a thousand species, but she's not eating fiber, then by the time she has mom, she's down to 700 species. So mom starts with 700. And by the time mom has you, she's down to 400. So you start at 400 and you start at a 60% deficit relative to grandma. And that, that deficit may be enough to make you far more fragile to developing disease than grandma was. Wow. So the, con so the concern is that there's this generational um, inheritance of the microbiome that could have negative consequences, that perhaps some of the issues that we're seeing in 2020 or in our generation are the result of the initiation of a low fiber diet that started with our parents and even our grandparents' generation. And, um, and what's interesting is... Uh, Ray of Hope here. Like, let me just say, as <laughs> we're all doomed. <laughs> the end. Yeah, as scary as that sounds. Okay. Well, I mean, look the the <laughs> the frame the framing of the question was why do we need to do it today? So, I mean, it, it, we have to have at least a little doom and gloom yep. in there. Um, but the Ray of Hope here is that if you reintroduce fiber, you can get the species back. All right. Um, you just have to do it early enough. So do it today. Why wait? Do the fiber today and support your gut microbiome and support the gut microbiome for future generations to come. And then the last thing that I wanted to say is this. This is the third thing. Um, I can't help but say that we need to think about the impact that we're having in our environment. I usually don't like to go there because I feel like as a medical doctor, it's not my place. But increasingly, I'm starting to feel like we can no longer deny the connection between our environment and human health. And if that connection is there, then it's my, it's my job as a medical doctor to, to make people aware of that connection. Mm -hmm. And so consider human population growth. Um, 
we have 7 billion people on the planet right now. We will have 10 billion people in 2050. So in 30 years, we will go from 7 to 10 billion people. Guess how many people there were in the year 1800? One. There was only 1 billion people on this planet in 1800. We're about to have 10 times that number in 250 years. Humans are resource consuming on a very heavy basis. We consume resources like crazy. The planet is reaching a point of saturation in terms of our consumption. And we need a food supply for 10 billion people. And how are we going to actually accomplish that? And they actually got together a bunch of scientists recently and um, they wanted to try to understand what is going to be the best way for us to preserve our environment, preserve the resources and not um, flog this planet to the point that we destroy ourselves. And so it was called the Eat Lancet Report. And um, one of the big issues that people need to realize is that 80% of the agricultural land, which we are currently sort of stretched and maxed out, 80% of that land produces just 18% of the calories that we consume. So we have a very inefficient system. And what I'm referring to, by the way, just to be totally clear in case it's not, is animal agriculture. There's a huge loss of efficiency when we build a diet around animal products. And that loss of efficiency has to do with the fact that, you know, if you have 10 calories when you start, and you feed those 10 calories to the cow, the cow is going to burn a certain percentage of those calories. The cow is going to use a certain percentage of those calories to build joints and bones and eyeballs and stuff that you're not going to eat. The cow is going to fart and poop out a certain percentage of those calories. And then a small fraction of it is what actually goes into creating the food product, which is the meat. So there's a huge loss of efficiency there where when you, you could have just had a human consume 10 calories, you could just feed that to the human. Why give it to the cow and run it through that system with that huge loss of efficiency? And this is how you end up in a scenario where 80% of our agricultural land produces just 18% of our calories. So when we see the Amazon rainforests burning, let's not be naive. That's a rainforest. It doesn't burn like California. This is not a forest fire. <laughs> These are man-made fires for forest clearing to create more land. Because you need more land if you want to expand that business. The land is already fully consumed. The only way to do more is to get more land. And so how are we going to do that with 3 billion more people? A 50% jump. How are we going to do that? Yeah, we're going to lose the whole, we're going to lose more, like all the rainforests. And this is what they think happened to Africa. Uh, there, I saw a really interesting, I don't know if it was a Ted talk, but it was the, the Africa and the Sahara desert didn't used to be a desert. Like we just think it's always been a desert. It actually wasn't. They cut down all the beautiful, huge, giant trees to make wood ships, you know, 500 years ago, 600 years ago. And because of that, the, the water that used to the moisture that the forests used to create, uh, helped to make the clouds and make rain on the inland of Africa. And with all the forests cut down for all the ships they built, it, um, it, it completely changed the dynamic of that continent. And that what they're thinking is, is going to happen to South America, that they're cutting down enough rainforest that it will forever change the ecosystem of an entire continent again. Like we have to learn from our history. We have to learn. And so I love that you're addressing this. A good uh, documentary to watch would be Cowspiracy. They, they, in, I think it's still on Netflix. It's a good documentary because they do cover uh, in more detail with, gra I'm a very visual person. So with graphics, they show, um, they show what you're addressing, but someone might say, but I, uh, eating animals is healthy for me. Like it's a necessary step. Isn't it healthy for me to eat this? I should have dairy because that's how you build strong bones. I should have eggs. Uh, that's a good, good source of vitamins and vitamin D. I, I should eat 
you know, animals because that's where I get my protein and my energy from. This is what we've been told since since we were children. Uh, so yeah. it's an it, it's like a necessary evil. Oh, I you know cows are beautiful and I don't want to hurt the environment, but but then if I didn't eat cows, it would be harmful to my body to not eat it. So I have to keep eating it. So this is this is the mindset that we're walking, you know, that many people still have because this is what we've been told our whole life uh, through all of the marketing. Um, so yeah. maybe you can address that because I because people are afraid to give up meat and eat more fiber uh, because they think it would be harmful to their body, that they wouldn't have energy, they wouldn't have protein, they wouldn't have those those vitamins that they're getting from dairy, eggs, and meat. Yeah. Let's start, let's start with the marketing campaign. Um, you know, marketing is incredibly powerful. Most food industries and also supplement industries have discovered that you're far better trying to um, attack people's emotions through marketing campaigns than you, you are actually conducting clinical research. Clinical research is expensive and it may not support the perspective that you want. It may in fact show the opposite, <laughs> right? And so why invest your money into that when you can invest your money into marketing campaigns that are designed to um, prey on people's insecurities or their emotions and build fear? And so uh, Got Milk, the entire campaign, which most people understand comes from our government, that was a government or maybe you don't. That was a government run campaign. Got milk was subsidized by the U.S. government. Beef. It's what's for dinner. That was a U.S. government subsidized campaign. Now, what is the government doing getting involved in what food we choose to eat? Well, that's the issue. There is lobbying that exists that is tremendously powerful. There's a reason why organic fruits and vegetables are expensive. The reason is that they're not subsidized at all. If you allowed animal products to be their true cost, the true cost would make them prohibitively expensive and we wouldn't have problems with people who are of lower socioeconomic status who as part of being lower socioeconomic status the vast majority of time, that also means lower educational level. And they don't have the ability to see the big picture, which is that going to McDonald's and getting the three ninety nine dollars Happy Meal, that your kid is jumping for joy and they're kissing you and they're thanking you and it's an easy dinner. That's actually hurting us. You know, we have made it readily accessible. We've made it cheap. We've gotten, we've, we've gotten rid of all the barriers to people consuming these unhealthy foods. And so you make the choice simple for people who fail to really have a complete understanding of what the big picture is and how that's going to hurt them in the long run. So, you know, when it comes to consuming these foods, um, here's the thing that I'll say, first of all, even if you are, cause if you, if you read my book, I really truly believe in meeting people where they are. And so I'm not in the business of saying this is all or nothing. You know, this is not black and white. I'm in the business of saying the path to optimal human health is with plants. All of the healthiest cultures in human history are predominantly plant-based. The blue zones, all five, 90 plus percent plant-based. It's the tie that binds them together. They are all predominantly plant-based. And so the evidence is clear. The science repeatedly shows us that when we substitute and we use plant products instead of animal products, we live longer with less disease. It's consistent. I mean, how many studies do we need to say the same thing? I feel like we're in the era 50 years ago where the tobacco industry was pushing back maybe 60 <laughs> years ago. Seriously, do you know how many studies they had to do to convince people that smoking actually caused lung cancer? Oh my gosh. There, there is no randomized controlled trial to prove that smoking causes cancer. It doesn't exist. Do we all agree that smoking causes lung cancer? It is so obvious. 
but they had to do a bazillion studies to convince people of this is the truth. And the problem is that you had a big tobacco industry that was extremely rich, was buying lobbying power, and was basically mobilizing their resources to create confusion and try to make this less clear. And now the exact same thing is repeating itself when it comes to our food. You have big industries that are tremendously powerful, that have bought influence, and they're also intentionally running and conducting studies or doing marketing campaigns to create confusion so that ultimately the status quo reigns supreme. And here we are, and the average American eats 220 pounds of meat per year. That is simply not sustainable. And the problem is that we get upset when we see the Amazon rainforest getting cut, getting burned, and we go do something about it. And we turn to our government. They're not going to do anything about it. First of all, they can't. Second of all, they're not motivated to because the lobbyists that are convincing them to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. But I want everyone to keep in mind, at the end of the day, we have the ultimate power, not them. The government can do whatever it wants to do, but we are the consumer and every single dollar that we spend is a vote for an industry. And when we choose to spend our money on purchasing 220 pounds of animal products, guess who we're making rich? That industry. Mm -hmm. Instead, if we cut it back, literally consider this. I mean, consider this picture, Ashley. American diet right now, 10% plants, 60% processed, 30% animal products. Oh my gosh. Okay. What if I did, what if we did this? What if we went to drop the, drop the processed food, replace it with plants? Okay. Now we're 70% plants, 30% animal products. Gosh, that's pretty good. But hold up 220 pounds of meat. That's absurd. Do we really need that much? So what if we cut that down by 65%? What if we took a third of that? We're still eating more than a pound of meat per week. You know, right now, the average American eats more than their own body weight in meat per year. All right, it's gross. And what if we cut that down to where we are consuming one third of that, 70 pounds, you know, 75 pounds? You can still have your meat. And now you have moved yourself into a blue zones diet where you are 90% plant-based, 10% animal products. But the truth is this, honestly, believe, and this is what happened for me. My favorite foods, if it was my birthday, I was going to have a ribeye and a glass of red wine. That was my food. All right. Mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing about it is that as I started to change my nutrition and the weight was melting off my body, and my, my anxiety was lifting and my blood pressure was dropping and my confidence was soaring. As I was doing that, I wanted more and more and more. I wanted to keep feeling better and better and better. So there's no reason to stop. You just keep ramping up your nutrition and doing better and better and better, emphasizing progress, not trying to be perfect. And you keep moving yourself in this direction. And I'm just going to tell you, you're going to get to, if you get to 90% plant-based, first of all, that's a healthy diet. Second of all, you're going to want more. Why would you stop? Keep going. And so, you know, for the people who live in fear of, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can be a hundred percent. You don't need to go and be a hundred percent starting today. You need to take an, you need to take an honest look in the mirror of what you're currently doing and say, where can we do a little bit better? I just want to start, you know, this week, give me one meal. Give me one meal that's plant-based. Start with that and let's go from there. I love it. So there's two, there's two things to consider in terms of the microbiome of the gut. You're a gut doctor. You're a gut specialist. So it's best to talk to you. There's the prebiotic and the probiotic. The probiotic is the alive bacteria that is digesting our food, making nutrients, making the short chain fatty acids, helping prevent disease in our body. The prebiotic is the fiber that we're eating that feeds. It's like, <laughs> I'll use this as an example because I, uh, I had a guest use it as an example. The, the six pound gut biome 
it's kind of like having a chihuahua, but she wanted, to, I think she, I wanted a panda. She wanted a kangaroo. Anyway, it's a six pound animal and it, you, people take care of their dogs more than, and their cats more than they take care of themselves. And I, I'm a pet owner. I, I will go out and buy the best food and the best everything. I know a woman who spends hundreds of dollars a month on handcrafted organic treats for her, uh, Mastiff. So, so we spent, we really take care of our animals. Imagine your gut biome is your pet. It's your pet. You take it for walks, go take it for a walk, go put it on a leash, take it for a walk. And because when you go for a walk, you're taking your pet bi microbiome for a walk, but the food you feed it is the food that's either going to allow it to thrive or it's going to kill it. Right. And, and the prebiotic, the fiber you eat is feeding it. Now, my question to you is about raw food versus cooked food versus like a packaged supplement, like taking a Metamucil as a, as a fiber. Um, we want to increase the biodiversity of the gut biome and how we do that is by eating a variety. But if I eat cooked broccoli versus raw organic, I'm always organic. So cook because the you know, pesticides, raw broccoli would raw does raw broccoli have an advantage over cooked broccoli in terms of feeding the microbiome and also introducing new healthy bacteria okay um there's a lot that i want to tackle but let's start here first of all raw versus cooked um, all plants contain fiber each plant has its own unique types of fiber and that fiber is specific to the way that the plant is being served. So there is a, um, another well-regarded microbiome researcher named Peter Turnbaugh, who did a study that, I mean, this is fairly new, this is less than a year old, this study, that I think is fascinating, where he basically looked at the effect on, on the microbiome of cooking the food. So raw versus cooked. And here's what he found. The key is there was a difference. You wouldn't describe necessarily that one is superior to the other. Instead, what you describe is that when you cook your food, you're creating different types of fiber that feed different microbes. We want to feed all the microbes. So the key is that rather than choosing one versus the other, we should have both. So if you are cooking your food, one of the things I talk about in my book is a health hack, which is that if you are cooking your food, you should have a nibble of the raw food before it's cooked. Ooh. So like if you're going to braise your, braise your greens, you know, braise your kale, just make sure you chop up a couple pieces of that kale and nibble on it while you're cooking, while you're braising those greens. Yeah. All right. So that's one of the things. Yeah. Kind of cool. Um, and then this whole, so there's, there's a couple of the topics that you brought up. You're bringing up so many great points that you just get me really excited to talk. <laughs> um, okay. Let's talk about, let's talk about organic versus non-organic in the context of living food. Now, when I say living food to the average person, they're going to hear fermented. And that's true. Fermented foods have microbes. But guess what? All life, most people have not thought of this, but all life has a microbiome. All life either has a microbiome or you are a part of the microbiome. Those are the two choices. If you're alive, <laughs> you're one of those two things. Oh, wait. Are we okay? the microbiome of the earth? We, I think we kind of are. I, I mean, I hate to say this. Actually, I think I kind of think we're a virus. <laughs> oh. Because we've grown exponentially and we're destructive. Aww. All right. Think about that. Yeah. Think about that growth. One billion in eighteen hundred. Two billion in nineteen hundred. Seven billion today. Ten billion in twenty fifty. That's exponential. That's the same thing that you see with viruses. Um. All right. So, the but all life has a microbiome. Right. And so take an apple, for example, they've actually studied this. They've discovered that an apple has about a hundred million microbes as a part of the apple. Tr 
tremendous diversity of species, actually more diversity on an apple than you will find inside the human body. And a couple paradoxical or interesting things, you know, uh, let me add curiosity, Ashley, because I'm guessing you're going to give the answer that anyone would, including me. Where do you think the microbes are on the apple? On the skin. Exactly. That's what I would say too. And it's not a bad answer. Anyone would say that. But actually, most of them are in the core. Ooh, in the core? Like the thing we throw out and don't eat? The part that we throw out. Ah! That's where most of the microbes are. So we should be juicing yeah. them, right? Because we're blending them? How would, you, how would we? It. Or just eat the core. Eat the core. Yeah. What? Yeah, why not? What's stopping you other than tradition? I guess there's ar- minor amount of arsenic in the seeds. Yeah, I mean, you could throw out the seeds. You don't have to eat the seeds if you don't want to. But, you know, what's interesting is this microbiome that this this plant has, it serves a purpose to the plant in the same way. There's, there's, there's parallel tracks that exist where these microbes um, are there to support plant life. You know, in the same way that these microbes support us, they're the architects of life on this on this planet, these microbes. So... We rely on our microbes to support us as we grow from, you know, newborn all the way to grown adult. And the same thing happens with these plants from flower to fruit. The microbiome of the individual plant is evolving and it's helping to facilitate the growth of the plant. And so, so this apple has a hundred million microbes in a tremendous diversity of species and they've looked at organic versus conventionally raised and what's cool is that the organic yet i mean to me yet another reason to motivate to consume organic the organic apple had more diversity so okay so more biodiversity on the apple that's a good thing that's a measure of health Mm -hmm. and also the organic apple had stronger representation of species that are known to be probiotic because the word probiotic does not just mean bacteria. To be considered probiotic, you have to actually demonstrate a health benefit in humans. So a, eating that apple, you know, it goes back to this idea, eat an apple a day, keep the doctor away. We're now learning that there's a lot of truth to that. And this is part of the reason why. These microbes. Fascinating. So, oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm going to start uh, eating the, apple cores now with my apple. Hey, no. um, and then the other thing that I wanted to say real quick is the uh, debate about prebiotics and probiotics. Okay, so and I'm moving a little bit into the supplement space. So before I move into it, let me just say above all else that diet always comes first. All right, diet and lifestyle come first. You can't supplement your way from a C minus gut to an A plus. That's impossible. Mm-hmm. You can't keep a junk. You can't keep a junk diet and have an A plus gut. That's impossible. If you want a good gut, you have to, you have to take care of your diet. It's the only way. All right. But that being said, there is a place for these prebiotics and probiotics. So let's talk about this. All right. Probiotics. So everyone's heard of probiotics, living bacteria that, as I just said, they have a health benefit in humans. So we always think like you got to take this capsule that has this probiotic, but that's again, a construct of marketing convincing us that the path to gut health is through a supplement. That's kind of what they've taught us. That's not true. Well, they've taught us that that go to the doctor, get a pill, you'll be fine, right? So they, I mean, I believe um, medications have their place, but we're overusing them 90% of the time. I believe that supplements absolutely have their place. But the problem is people have the mentality, like you said, you cannot ups- out-supplement a bad diet, just like you can't out-drug a bad diet. A bad diet's a bad diet. And I know everyone listening probably eats way healthier than the average person and, and genuinely wants to eat even healthier than that. So uh, if we could incorporate a good diet and then find a supplement just to help get, get us like kickstart us or get us like an edge... Um, I'm sure we're all interested. So we understand that the advice you're about to give is has to go in conjunction with a really good uh, gut health diet. Yes. Yes. A supplement is meant to be the word. It's a supplement, right? It's done in addition to a healthy diet. And there's definitely a place. 
And I think going back to your point, you know, I just want to um, double down on what you said, which is that we should not live in a world of absolutes, meaning that we should not choose to live in a world where we are fully reliant on pills and procedures for our health. That doesn't work. And we also shouldn't live in a world where we believe that diet alone is a silver bullet. That's not true. You know, the, the optimal approach for human health is to optimize diet and lifestyle to fully support and potentially even extend your health with the use of supplements that are targeted um, and frankly not excessive. I don't believe in taking 20 different supplements because uh, you just don't know what the interactions are. But um, supplementation where appropriate to optimize our health and then engaging with the healthcare system where appropriate to protect ourselves. So anyway, the, um, you know, we've been sold to this idea that probiotics are the source of gut health. And, you know, the problem is that you, for example, Ashley have a completely unique gut microbiome. There's literally no one on the planet with the same microbiome as you, including your mom. All right. It's like a fingerprint. And when I give you a probiotic, I am prescribing a generic formula. And what I'm doing is I'm really crossing my fingers and hoping that when this generic formula mixes with your completely unique gut microbiome, that we get good chemistry. And you just don't know. There are some people who benefit, no question. There's also a lot of people who spend a lot of money and they get nothing. So we have to understand this limitation of our current approach. But the second part is we should understand that these probiotics, they already live inside of us. We don't need to introduce it from the outside with the um, hope that we're introducing something that our body is missing. Instead, we just need to acknowledge that the microbes that live inside of us, we could use them and just make them stronger make them more powerfully represented. And that's where prebiotic comes into play, which is that Ashley, once again, you have a completely unique gut microbiome. And although I don't know the nooks and the crannies and the details of what's there and what's not, what I do know is this, that if I feed your microbes with a prebiotic, I'm going to be selecting for specific healthy bacteria. I'm going to be selecting for the probiotics and we're going to enrich them. We're going to make them po more powerful, more well-represented. We're also going to be feeding them. Fiber is requisite for feeding these, these microbes. And then they're going to have the ability to transform that into short chain fatty acids. And so just to step back for a moment and reconsider our big picture, if we had probiotics, but we did not have fiber, there really wouldn't be much of a point. If we had fiber, but we were sterile creatures, which we're not, there really wouldn't be much of a point to fiber. But when fiber, specifically prebiotic fiber, connects with these bacteria, specifically probiotic bacteria, magic takes place. Mm. And what we get are postbiotic short-chain fatty acids. And the entire point of this relationship is not one or the other. The entire point is what happens when you connect the two. And that's why I'm a bigger believer in prebiotics than probiotics. Because you already have a gut biome. It might be, it might be like, I've, I've heard someone reference the Americans have the micro Simpson of gut biomes because it's so undiverse <laughs> that it's kind of like just the, we, we need to have something more complex and intelligent or might we have to incorporate and support our microbiome to be, um, to have um, many more species to so be much more diverse. And we can do that over time by eating a variety of plants that are organic because we we um, take on the microbiome. Like you said, you eat the core of the apple with the apple. You're taking on, your gut is taking on those bacteria that become part of your healthy and diverse gut biome. But the most important thing is feed it, feed it first. So we have to feed it before uh, you just take a probiotic. I, I heard this study once that they, they had people take a probiotic like acidophilus, right? We all have heard of acidophilus. And then they had they examined their stool a month after they had stopped taking it and they found that the acidophilus was no longer there. They thought, oh, for sure, taking, totally. taking the probiotic would 
uh, so taking acidophilus or whatever probiotic would have then continued to live in the gut, right? And it doesn't, right. probably right. because they didn't change their diet to incorporate enough fiber to feed it to continue it, its its development. So you're saying the most important thing is start by feeding the gut the healthy fiber, variety of fibers, both cooked and raw, so that the gut can get fed, so the microbiome can get fed. I know you've got to go, and I definitely want to have you back on the show because I, I have this like whole list of, of topics and questions I want to explore, how to how to reverse um, constip chronic constipation, how to how to reverse diarrhea what about people who have ibs or you know have a really irritated bowel and they they can't they can't tolerate every time they try to eat fiber they can't tolerate it these are topics i want to go deep with you and so i'd love to have you back on the show to to explore that you know you keep uh, mentioning hormone balance as well that's something i'd like to go deeper and have you explain why is it that healing the gut and fiber and the microbiome um affects our, our sex hormones and our stress hormones why, why does it affect all, all of the hormones in our body interesting that i've heard that 25 percent of our t3 our thyroid hormone is converted in the gut that without mm -hmm. a healthy gut, we have low T3 levels, significantly low, so right. low, in fact, that then someone's put on medicine. And isn't that a shame that there are so many doctors out there that prescribe uh, a synthetic T3 uh, drug w without even addressing gut health because it could, the root cause could be in that person's gut and likely statistically is given how little fiber uh, the average person eats. So there's so many more things to explore. And I definitely want listeners to know about your website, the plantfedgut.com, the links to everything that Dr. Will does is going to be in the show notes of today's podcast at Learn True Health. I definitely am going to encourage listeners to buy your book as well. And the link to your book will be there. And people can also go to your website, the plant fed gut. And it says right there, want the ultimate plant fed super snack. Uh, put in your name and email and they get a little booklet from you. That's really cool. And of course, um, they can follow you as well on Instagram. I saw some of your Instagram posts and I really, really appreciated them. One in particular was about uh, racial equality and um, that you address that we cannot have racial equality until we have medical equality. And if we really right. look statistically, um, our medical system is so skewed, especially in the United States. I mean, other countries it is less, but in the United States it is so skewed and it is not a fair system. Um, we need to change, we need to uh, make sure that our medical freedoms are protected for everyone and that medicine is available to everyone. And I, and that's, and I don't, I mean, I'm not, I want to get into politics. I'm just, I love that you address that. Hey, w while we're all on this, um, while we're all really conscious of it's in our daily consciousness to be addressing and looking at and trying to change racial equality, we should know. And we should also address that, that medical equality needs to be addressed in order to, to, to fully, um, help everyone of all races. Uh, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I love your message. You are, you're speaking out. You're kind of a black sheep, you know, and, and I, and I just, uh. <laughs> I'm so excited that you're here. Uh, this is talking to my, our, our community, talking to our community of listeners. You are, you are, we're all the black sheep. Let's just say we, you, we are all on the same page as you. So at times, if you ever feel like you're an, the odd one out because you're the MD that doesn't want to give people drugs um, uh, but first, but wants to really, really help people on a root level heal their body and do it in a way that is radical. It's radical to tell someone to eat plants and not meat. I mean, it's kind of, it's totally radical. And yet you're, you're going to see, you're going to get more and more and more results the more uh, we go down this path. I just interviewed a, 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 an MD who's been a plant-based doctor for 39 years. And, and so I love that I'm, I'm uh, you and your career and you're seeing how you can help people. And then you can, you can even go do a col colonoscopy and see that these diets actually work and they help uh, heal the body from the inside out and and knowing all the science of exploring the microbiome, it's so fascinating. Please come back on the show. I'd I just I'd love to have you back. I'd love to continue to learn from you. 
I appreciate it, Ashley. I definitely would love to come back. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't feel like a black sheep. I feel <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I mean, seriously, I just, it's like, I, I guess for me, maybe I'm too, uh, it just seems so obvious. Right. It just seems so obvious. So we need to talk about it. And, um, and I'm not afraid to uh, share uh, how I feel about these kinds of things because it's really important for people. And if this is the way to heal people, then we need to put it out there. And that's that's been sort of something that has been a part of me and everything I've done. And it's brought me to where I am today. Um, I just wanted to add real quick a couple things. I hope you don't mind. Oh, please do. At the plantfedgut.com, we have a COVID-19 guide. We have a guide to clinical research. I really think that one of the big issues, this is why I wrote this guide, is that people are confused by the conflicting information that they receive. And on a, on a uh, consumer level, we have to have protections in place where we become smart enough to sniff out a fraud, yeah. to sniff out something that's fake, to sniff out an agenda and to see the truth because mm -hmm. the truth exists but there's a lot of noise and the only way that we're going to find the truth because the truth brings us to health. The truth is the compass that guides us to health. But the only way to find that is to get rid of the noise and you have to, you can't believe every single word that every person puts out there. We have to start discriminating because we have excessive access to information these days. And then the other thing I wanted to add is that probably by the time this episode airs, I am um, I have a course that I'm starting in late August that I'm super excited about. And basically what this is, is it is an opportunity to connect deeper with me and my ideology to go beyond the book and to basically, you know, one of the problems that I see when I see problems, I go, okay, how are we going to fix this? Well, one of the problems is that I only get 30 minutes with my patient and I wish I could have a day to just like completely educate and give them everything. Yeah. And that's where this course comes in. It's a structured way for me to give you over seven weeks, all of the information that I think is necessary to actually understand gut health and to understand how to navigate our healthcare system to make yourself well. And what's cool is I've been working on this course for about a year and I, I'm just releasing it for the first time, but I've beta tested it twice in private with small groups and had amazing results. I've had people who have suffered with more with issues for more than 10 years who have healed because the course empowered them with the right information to know how to talk to their doctor and what questions to ask. And then we and then we found solutions. Yeah. So um, so I'm super excited about it because it's just another way for me to connect with more people and provide the information and education necessary to help people to heal so that they're not overly reliant on a system that's not giving it to them. Let me step in and intervene and give you what you need. Mm, I love it. I love it. And so many symptoms people don't realize are related to gut issues, like the thyroid we had mentioned, but also serotonin levels. So depression and anxiety um, often are the root is in the gut. Uh, because the, the there's a direct relationship between serotonin production and and gut health and um, and the nerves that connect the brain to the gut, um, skin issues so psoriasis, psoriasis eczema, uh, dermatitis, uh, the, the list goes on and on. Like you you had mentioned hormones, uh, but our our brain fog, our energy, um, our weight gain. There's there's so many health issues that you don't realize start in the gut. And so by he making sure we have the healthiest gut possible, we may actually be resolving mental emotional health issues and, and strengthening our mental emotional health, strengthening the health of our immune system. 70% of our immune system is sur uh, surrounds our gut and is directly affected by our gut uh, and by the food we eat. And I'm sure you have this information on your website, especially because you have a guide to COVID and, and, and um, maintaining optimal health through this. Listeners can go to theplantfedguy.com. They can fill out their information to get your uh, super snack guide for yep. gut health. And then once your course is available, you just email them. Is that the best way 
for um, for them to That's be right. notified. That's right. Plantfedgut com. Yeah. What's the name of your yeah. course? Have you named it yet? Yep. Yeah, it's it's the Plant Fed Gut Online course. Okay. Great. Easy enough right. to remember. Awesome. Well, we'll have all that information in the show notes of today's podcast. Thank you so much. Please come back on the show. I'd love to have you back. I would definitely will. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Dr. Will Bolshevitz. It was amazing. I did not know that fiber in the gut creates short chain fatty acids that is so important for our overall health. And there's so many fascinating things to learn about how we can support the microbiome through our diet. Coming up next in the next episode, you're going to we're going to dive even deeper and learn more about how we can support the microbiome of the body with the food that we eat and how we can actually t- use tests, special lab tests that you can do in your own home that will tell you all about what foods to eat and what foods not to eat to best support your microbiome in producing special chemicals that heal the body and boost the immune system. It is so fascinating. Now, as you listen to the episodes of all these amazing people and you think to yourself, you would love to learn more about holistic health. You'd love to learn more about how you can heal your body and also help others. If you're interested in augmenting your, your own health, or changing your career and becoming a health coach, I highly recommend checking out IIN, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. I went through their program. I absolutely loved it. You know, many people go through the program just for personal growth alone. And I had such an amazing time with the personal growth that I got out of it that I would have just done it for that alone. But on top of that, you also learn a whole career. So you can do it just for yourself and your own personal growth, or you can do it to help your friends and family, or you could do it to shift careers, or maybe you already work with people and you want to have another tool in your tool belt. IIN sets you up to be successful as a health coach. They train you how to do it and they, they guide you. They hold your hand. It's an amazing program. It's very nourishing. It's all about holistic health on not only a physical level, but also a mental and emotional level and a spiritual level and an energetic level. It's a fantastic program. Why don't you just try a, a, a section of their course for free? Go to learntruehealth.com slash coach. That's learntruehealth.com slash coach. And they'll give you a free uh, module for you to try out and see if you like it and see if that's something that um, well, you'd be interested in. And if you're interested in it, call IIN, just Google IIN, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and talk to them. Make sure you mention Ashley James and the Learn Trail podcast, because they give a huge discount to our listeners. I've been just raving about them for years because I had a wonderful experience with them. And so many of our listeners have gone through their program as well. So they've given all of our listeners a really fantastic discount. So you can go ahead and check out a free module by going to learntrout.com slash coach. And you could just give them a call, just Google IIN and call the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Everyone you talk to on the phone has gone through their program. So they could actually sit down with you almost like a coaching session and they can help you plan out your goals. They genuinely want to help you. It's not like a sales pitch when you get on the phone with them. It's not like a, a some high pressured sales pitch. It's they're really um, lovingly and genuinely want to support everyone to make the right choice for them. And if IIN is the right choice, then they want to help you with that. Uh, so go ahead, check it out, give them a call, see how you like it. I highly recommend it and encourage you to check it out. If you're looking to do some uh, online learning, especially these days when we can be home more, learning more, absorbing more great information to better ourselves. What a perfect time to do that, to take this time to go into our cocoon and transform ourselves. We can choose to be a victim or we can choose to be at cause in our world. And I choose to be at cause in my world, transforming myself. When the times get tough, I'm going to transform myself. I'm going to choose to learn and grow and be even better when times are hard. And I know you want to as well. Have a fantastic rest of your day. I'm looking forward for you to listen to the next episode. It's going to be fantastic. I can't wait. Please share this episode with those you love and continue sharing so we can help as many people as possible to learn true health.